Um, I just wanted to real quick ask you, uh, can you clarify your definition of critical race theory? Yeah, Derek Bells. So what he wrote in 1991, Intro to Critical Race Theory. What's in that book? Are you familiar with that literature? Well, yeah, I read the book, but I don't remember anything about it. It was for like a college class. But like, uh, well, but you didn't go to college, so I guess you wouldn't know. Um, it's true, I didn't. Oh, f <laughs> We'll edit that out. My train, oh, oh, my bad. Wait, am I not allowed to? It's not encouraged. Oh, okay, sorry. Why do you keep bringing up race whenever you're on, or speaking on a stage? I am not speaking on a stage bringing up critical race theory. You no, are, no, no. So. I'm bringing up how critical race theory destroys society and how we shouldn't talk about race all the time. Hey fam, welcome and welcome back to One and Done. Charlie Kirk is a conservative commentator from Turning Point USA. And a couple of years ago, a progressive leftist student a Justin Bieber lookalike took Charlie to task on critical race theory. Now in this debate, Charlie Kirk displays the patience of a monk and slices and dices with the precision of a surgeon. Now before we jump in, don't forget to hit the like, smash the subscribe, ring the notification bell, and let's roll that tape. Okay, um, I just wanted to real quick ask you, uh, can you clarify your definition of critical race theory? Uh, yeah, Derek Bells. So what he wrote in 1991, Intro to Critical Race Theory. What's in that book? The whole book is your definition. Um, how about this? Oh, the one I used. Call everything racist till you control it. Oh, so wait, but then that literally means that critical race theory can mean basically anything you want it to, right? Like, can, Only can if I you're calling like it a... racist till you control it. I mean, I'm defining critical race theory in the modern American context as that. We can go back to Herbert Marcuse, One Dimensional Man, or Jacques Derrida, or Michel Foucault, but the most agreed upon legal, no, I'm sorry, the most agreed upon academic theory is Intro to Critical Race Theory, 1991 by Derek Bell. Yeah. Wait, but- Are you familiar with that literature? Well, yeah, I read the book, but I don't remember anything about it. It was for like a college class. Like, let's be honest, nobody remembers the books they read in college. Um, Sounds like a great value proposition to go to college. No, 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 it is, trust me. <laughs> but like, uh, well, but you didn't go to college, so I guess you wouldn't know. Um, it's true, I didn't. So, so let me ask you though, does that mean that I'm not able to have this conversation with you? Because I no. actually remember the book and you didn't and you paid hey. for it. <laughs> so first of all, I didn't pay for it. Uh, there's these things called scholarship. Oh, so somebody else so, paid for you not to yes. remember the book. <laughs> Exactly. that you're supposed to read. Oh, Anyways. some wealthy uh -huh. donor or taxpayer paid for you hey, to not remember the book. I have a question. Um, who are your wealthy donors? Many of them are in this room. Thank you guys for your wonderful support, by the way. Interesting. We have over 130,000 grassroots donors at Turning Point USA, 130,000. I think we have some people in the back that chip in $5, $10, $15. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. We are a grassroots funded operation. So I find these debates with students are quite interesting, right? So it obviously it takes courage to get up and to talk and take Charlie on. And I'm sure the student originally when he came up, he was coming from a reasonably good and honest place. Now he's white and he's feeling sorry for black people, so he's trying to speak up for them. It happens all the time. But the problem he ran into is he didn't have any knowledge about the subject. And so far, Charlie's been able to dismantle his argument. Now feeling under pressure, this young boy started with the ad hominem attacks. Now we see this quite often, it's quite common, where these students call out Charlie for not going to university or having a degree. Then he tries to paint a picture that Charlie and Turning Point USA are funded by big donors. And once again, he falls flat on his face. Now, when it comes to critical race theory, I'm not an expert on the subject, but I do have common sense. And whenever race is involved in the equation, usually it puts one race ahead of the other. And to me, that's just racist. And it's funny how critical race theory seems to target whites and claims that whites are in power. Now we've got someone from another minority group that is gonna tear that argument down. Sandra, an inconvenient minority. That is the name of a new book by our next guest and how author Kenny Hsu refers to Asian Americans. As an Asian American himself, Hsu explains how he's considered to be an inconvenient minority to the critical race theory narrative. Let's bring in author Kenny Hsu. He's also the president of Color Us United. Kenny, great to see you today. Uh, you said in an interview with foxnews.com, Asian Americans prove that critical race theory is not true, cannot be true. Make that case. 
Well, critical race theory asserts, and, and I talk about this in my book, An mm -hmm. Inconvenient Minority, but critical race theory asserts that the world in America is divided into a racial caste system, whites on the top, blacks on the bottom, but they have no idea what to do with Asian Americans because Asian Americans are a minority. You know, they have been discriminated against in this country, and yet sure. they succeed and they achieve. And uh, that, that, I think, inconveniences the critical race theory narrative today, and that's why I wrote this book. You make the argument that if America is systemically racist, as many proponents of critical race theory believe, how is it that Asian Americans have flourished and in many cases overtaken whites in terms of level of education and socioeconomic status? So, so how is it? How is it that Asian Americans flourish in this country? It has to do with culture. You know, Asian Americans study twice as many hours as the average American. Today, we always talk about the Tiger Mother. You know, that was Amy Chua's fa uh, famous book. Um, but it's not just Tiger Mother parenting. It's also strong two-parent family structures. It's a strong value on education. It's a love for hard work and for meritocracy. And that's at stake with critical race theory because critical race theory is anti-meritocratic. It believes that merit is racist. So if policies like Harvard's discrimination against Asian Americans are allowed, guess who loses out? Well, it's the hardworking Asian Americans that work so hard to get their spot. And in fact, white Americans are somewhere fifth, sixth, seventh on the list of the wealthiest demographics in America. So it sort of proves that Casper really is a ghost. What Kenny's saying is, if you put in the work, if you put in the time, if you study, that is a component that will help you advance. That will give you more options. And another component is a strong two-parent family structure. That provides the best platform. It gives you balance, security, and stability. And I agree, your color, your ethnicity, shouldn't be a factor at all. It should be based on meritocracy. Now we're in a world market, and if we look around the world, Asian, Indian, Sri Lankan, who all have high marriage rates, place a huge emphasis on education. And worldwide, we're seeing them being doctors, lawyers, and in general, chasing careers rather than jobs. Which brings me to my next point, because we now see the emergence, Harvard and other places, of attempts to limit Asian American enrollment in some of these prestigious uh, educational institutions. That would appear to be the very definition of systemic racism, to, to limit the number of people who can get in on a merit-based program uh, in order to keep up levels of enrollment of other people. You know, I analyzed 90,000 pages of Harvard admissions data. And stretching back for 30 years, Asian Americans have been kept at a cap at admissions between 15 and 18 percent of the student body. That has only recently changed. And, you know, Harvard's own estimates said that if Asians were not discriminated against they would be 43% of the student body. Now people are saying, well, is that too many Asians? Well, I say, I'm indignant at that claim. I'm indignant at the claim that Asians are all the same kind of person, they're all the same kind of faceless, test-taking robot with no personality. We have to look past race in this country. And I wrote this book, hopefully, to heal America and to bring Americans together in service of meritocracy. So I asked Vivek Ramaswamy this question yesterday, and, and let me ask you as well. Yeah. Have, you, have you personally experienced <laughs> racism in this country? And, and what did you do to keep it in perspective? Well, I have to say, America has been very good to me. Um, yes, I've experienced racism, especially, you know, from the Ivy Leagues when they judge Asian Americans as low personalities, that's what Harvard does. Um, but you know what, America has been very good to me and America has been good to every person in every of this country. Uh, one of the things in my book that I talk about is this guy named Bin Vo, he's a Vietnamese American. Mm -hmm. He came to this country from Vietnam and he, um, and he was, the, with the instant he landed here, uh, you know, a police officer picked him up and sent him home. Uh, and he, that was an act of charity that he did not, he could not find in his home country. That's the goodness of America, and I want to highlight that. There's some great points there. Now, I think everyone has experienced racism at some level, but if you know who you are and you know what you're about, you shouldn't let that hold you back. Why would you give someone the power and authority to hold you down? Pay them no mind and keep it moving. Now, I believe they've got rid of affirmative action admissions in college, and I think a group of Asian students won a court case as well. And that court case was about discriminating against Asian students in admissions. Now, anyway, getting back to Charlie Kirk, 
Now he's about to wrap this conversation up with this progressive leftist student. But let me give you another example. I'll give you five things that critical race theory believes. Number one, the notion that racism is ordinary and everywhere. Number two, the idea of interest convergence, otherwise known as intersectionality. Number three, the social construction of race, meaning that there is a social construction around race in our society. The four, idea of storytelling and counter story storytelling. Number five is that no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you do, you cannot remove racism from your society. Those are five pillars of critical race theory based on Derek Bell's Intro to Critical Race Theory. Does that, does that ring a bell? Um, yes. Bro, like, you're lying. Okay, you're so lying. let me stick with this. Um, what do you think... Oh, f <laughs> We'll edit that out. My train, oh, oh, my bad. Wait, am I not allowed to... It's not encouraged. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> what was the third point? My mind is dying. The social construction of race? The social construction of race. Do you not think that race is uh, at least partially socially constructed? Depends how you define it. So, like, what defines where one race ends and where one race begins? Depends who you're asking. I think race is completely and totally irrelevant. Do you think race is relevant? No. Okay, then why are we talking about race all the time? And why are we talking about critical race theory? Well, you brought it up at first when you were doing your speech. Right, so, remember I said it was a lie from the pit of hell that we should repudiate and stop talking about all the time? <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're on scholarship? Sorry, what? Nothing, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, to answer your question, I don't think that race means anything, and I guess you don't either, right? Yeah. Right, so then why do you keep bringing up race whenever you are on or speaking on a stage? I am not speaking on a stage bringing up critical race theory. You no, are. No, no, no. So. I'm bringing up how critical race theory destroys society and how we shouldn't talk about race all the time. Okay, but you're bringing up race. No, no, critical race theory, not race. Okay, so... What's the second word in that? Yeah, it's race, but it's a theory of how to view race, of which is a mind virus pathogen destroying America, of which I said again, just to reemphasize for those in the back, we could replay the tape, we throw the red flag, to we'll watch it over again. I said that what? Race means nothing. I care about your actions, your character, and most importantly, your soul. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Now that wraps that up fam, Charlie dismantling this Justin Bieber lookalike and gave us a great descriptive quick breakdown of critical race theory. I think any ideology that lifts up people based on race or pushes them down based on race is racist. I look forward to you guys jumping into the comment section. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think about critical race theory, affirmative action or anything that else that's on your mind. Now, if you like this content, don't forget to hit the like, smash the subscribe, ring the notification bell, and I'll catch you in our next video.